Hello everyone. Well, on face. Hello everyone on Facebook and on Zoom. This is the invention of the seventh day week with Dr. Ezra Zuckerman Sivan. This is the fourth session on May thirty first. It's a pleasure to have everyone. Uh, pleasure to um, learn with Dr. Zuckerman Sivan again. And as always, the chats are monitored both in Zoom and on Facebook Live. If you have any questions, no, please please feel free to type them in. Handouts will come out shortly. And welcome. Thank you, Kayla. Welcome, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well. Um, as we've been going forward, I've been experimenting a little bit with how much to do on PowerPoint, how much source sheets. We're going to do almost exclusively on source sheets this time. Um, as always, we will be playing off uh, the uh, our main focus, which is Shmot Tetzayin, Exodus 16. Um, but if you look at the source sheet, um, the people do have, yes? Um, thank you, Noah. Um, and um, that will have, a, oh, it has actually, it has, um, it has that on sources that five or six, we'll get there. Um, yeah, six is also that, is that Peric again? Um, but let me, just to give you a little bit more background of what we're going to do today and how this fits into the arc of the course. And, and then we'll get to it. And this is why we'll hope that um, right now we've got Robert with the video showing. Hey, there, hey Robert. And um, a couple others. Hopefully, we'll get a couple others because there'll be a moment in this, which is really, really, really the heart of the course, um, where it would be great to get people to be fully engaged and even thinking with me. So I want to hear how you think about what I think is the to me, the, the kind of the, the heart of the whole thing. Uh, and so we'll, we'll get there. Oh, it says host has disabled screen sharing. Can you One moment. Okay. All right. So this is the question for today. Um, and I'm going to build to it. But the basic focus of the question is going to be on the very harsh enforcement regime, capital punishment in particular, that uh, is at the week. We just situate where we are at. So what have we established so far? So um, you recall the, the animating question really is about uh, the invention of the week, both from the scientific perspective and from a Torah perspective, biblical perspective. And um, what we've gone through is a sort of like, if you recall, I started off with that crisis of mind, which is, wait a second, doesn't appreciate, what doesn't Genesis present the, uh, the seven day week is sort of primordial build and creation. Then we said, no, in fact, it's the metaphysical idea of the week. And then we've been really focusing on uh, this story of the, the Parsha Hamat, the chapter 16 of the book of Exodus. And this is the various, the various things that we've established so far about Shemot Tetzayin. Uh, one is it describes the week as uh, the Shabbat slash week. So it means both those things in Hebrew and the biblical Hebrew uh, as a bewildering disruptive invention, uh, which is a, keeping with what it would have been uh, in it would have been a break in, in world history to have a cycle like this. Um, the second uh, lecture, we um, talked about it as a paradigm. So the first Shabbat is the ultimate at some level. Shabbat is the first, the first um, uh, of, this, of the, you know, becomes a cycle after that first Shabbat, becomes the thing to be remembered uh, and to be kept. And then we talked about it as it's a fusion. And this is what the, the two uh, um, different historical anchors that are in the two different um, versions of the, of the, of the Decalogue of the Sarah wrote. Uh, one, and so it's the, it's the experience, a special experience of creator, two different, two different um, stories of creation, both as the little creator uh, emulating God and as sort of his junior partner. Uh, and it also has the element of the of sort of egalitarianism, uh, anti hierarchical ideal. We'll see more of that as we uh, today. Uh, and it's a fulfillment of the Exodus. In particular, we noted, um, we'll come back to this, that in uh, sort of forecasting uh, the stages of Yitzhak Mitzrayim of the Exodus, uh, that uh, you know God lays out this is the beginning of Parshat um, Vaera. Uh, that God says that there's going to be some moment in which you're going to know God, know me, uh, know God. And that occurs. Um, it sort of it doesn't come up again 
until the opening of the, of the Parsha Haman, and that seems to be taking place in this process. And then finally, last, the last uh, uh, um, session we had, I bolded it here. Um, we talked about it as it's not simply a climax for the Exodus and that it fulfills um, that promise, which we come to know God as our Redeemer, um, but it also reshapes our understanding of God, that is sort of our theological conception of God. Um, not just as a warrior or a destroyer, at first we think on our behalf, and then second we think, oh no, maybe uh, judging us harshly. Um, that's the sort of process that we described coming out of Kriyat Yamsuf and, um, and that, that panic at the beginning of, the chap of, of that chapter. Um, but then we learn through God's response and the, uh, the, the story of the Man and the Shabbat to see God not just as a, a warrior and destroyer, and hopefully on our behalf, but sometimes not, um, but as a parent uh, and a provider, okay? So that's where we are. And, um, oops, one second here. That was just, up. Where, what, okay, where we are so far. Let me actually turn this off and move to the source sheet. Given that setup, so if we just learned, right, that uh, we just un came, came to understand that the sh Shabbat and Amman teach us to see God as a provider and as a parent, maybe a stern parent, but still a parent. Um, and he's freely giving us Shabbat as a gift, freely giving us Shabbat. Then the fact that Shabbat is a capital crime, right, becomes very, very hard to understand. In fact, you can see this from a couple different angles. So no, is Shabbat a capital crime? Well, if you look at uh, Shemot Lamed Aleph, so this is now, the last, it's the seventh actually, revelation of Moshe on, on, on Sinai, just about just before the sin of the golden calf. This is going to be maybe our most important text that we'll have for the last two sessions. Uh, it's the one we talked about before because it, it, it concludes with uh, Basham Rubin Israel the Shabbat, right? So um, some a text we're, we're all very familiar with. Um, then leading to the idea that, that uh, um, Shabbat is a sign that God created the world six days and rested on the seventh. So it's the other time it anchors it in creation. Uh, the first part of this, of this uh, sugya, uh, of, this, of this revelation, um, is going to be our focus next session. This is where God describes um, the observance of Shabbat to Moshe as a sign somehow that imparts knowledge that God is sanctifying Israel. So we're gonna come back to that. But our focus is gonna be on the middle part. And the main focus here is that twice, like it's not, not, not enough to say it once, but twice, it's sort of a chiastic, right? There's an ABA quality to this middle of, um, there's actually, there's the whole, the whole um, thing, the whole sugya is really a chiasm, but that section certainly, you've got um, anyone who, profanes, desecrates, or Chilol Shabbat uh, is put to death, right? Um, it then defines what that is, and then, and then comes back that same language again. Um, so you, you um, do Malacha on Shabbat, you do uh, work, whatever that means, um, you, um, you are put to death. In the middle we learn, you get also get Karet, right? You cut what, you know, we have a rabbinic understanding of that, but um, cutting off somehow from the community. So, you know, pretty harsh. Not just for getting caught from the community, but you are put to death for violence. And that's not enough. Uh, after the sin of the golden calf, uh, when we, you know, the opening to uh, Moshe now giving instructions uh, to build uh, the Mishkan, the tabernacle, we have a repet repetition of this. Moshe makes sure to get his message across. So I want to suggest that this is, this is something that when we usually discuss this, so A, we don't usually think about it in these terms, I think. Um, even observant Jews don't think about it in this way. And then when we do, we think of it of the notion that Shabbat is a capital crime or that um, uh, desecrating Shabbat is a capital crime. We usually think of it as very abstract, non-practical terms. If you look just quickly at, um, oh, let me set it up in a, different, in a different, another reason why we should be shocked by this. So here is maybe the most famous statement about the meaning of a Shabbat, uh, at least in the, for the general public. Orthodox people tend to be a little nervous about quoting Heschel, 
but he's, he's sort of broken through. And a lot of Orthodox uh, rabbis will, will quote Heschel, um, gingerly perhaps, but everybody knows this quote. A lot of people know this quote anyway. The notion that Jewish people have a love affair with the Shabbat, that we're in love with the Shabbat. And I think the reason why this is very popular uh, you know, among Orthodox uh, communities too is because it resonates. We all love the Shabbat. Right? We would be nowhere without the Shabbat, as the Haram sort of said. And it's not, you know, it's partly it's the love that we have of Shabbat. But here's the thing if something is beloved and we do it out of love, why would we, does it need to be enforced with a really harsh enforcement regime? Generally speaking, when we, you know, well, you know, what's the first thing we, we if we're going to consider, you know, we may be ambivalent about capital punishment in general, but if we're going to apply it at all, we tend to apply it obviously to what? To murder, right? And things that we think that might be that harsh. And we think about it in consequentialist terms. That is, okay, putting aside our moral indignation and our desire to, you know, give people back what they actually, you know, what they did. What's our usual, let's have a, a participation on this one. If you had to summarize why in sort of utilitarian terms, if we're trying to um, you know, justify it from the purpose of society, how, if we're gonna make a case for capital punishment, how do we do that? Why, why would we, um, or at least why, why, how would we justify giving our harshest punishment to murderers? You know, cold-blooded, premeditated murder. Why wouldn't we do that? What are we worried about if we make the punishment too light? Anyone? What would you worry about if you if, if you just got, you know, I don't know, a fine or something? Yeah. The, yeah. There'd be there'd be no strings attached. There'd be no strings attached to breaking Shabbat. It's just like, oh, you know, it's like you get a parking ticket. Okay, you for Shabbat. Fine. But I, I'm let's have, let's get the Shabbat in a minute. I'm asking exactly. Yes. Yeah. So it implies that anything you're going to attach capital crime to, it must be. You can get. It's basically the, the the disincentive is very weak. We worry the disincentive is too weak. In the case of murder, why would we worry that the disincentive is too is too, too weak? Why do we want to have a strong disincentive? against murder. It's a, it's a, yeah, Kayla. Um, well, I think we want to, dis well, one reason we don't want to disincentivize murder is it's, you know, it's not just like one of the low tasks says, it's one of the 10 commandments. It's not just, it's yeah, not well, just don't do this, but it's like a big Judaism don't do this. aside for a second. I'm just talking okay. about, oh, okay. there's, there's nothing about this that's Jewish. Oh, for right? the fact that huh. murder is a capital crime, that has nothing to do with Judaism. It is true the Torah says that, but you don't need Judaism for that, right? You don't need the Torah for that. Yeah. Um, it's basically ratifying something that is fairly universal, right? We, we tend to give the harshest punish to murderers, cold-blooded premeditated murderers, because if we don't put a harsh disincentive, people will do it, right? And the more people do it, the more we wreck society. Um, if I can highlight two comments from the chat. Yeah. Um, what we in, yeah. I guess, reverse chronological order from Noah, it's like, Murder is irreversible. Yeah, interesting. That's good. You don't get a second chance. Yeah. And, and from Robert Cohen, who was saying that the death penalty, to what we commented earlier, that like the death penalty makes Karaites superfluous and irrelevant. Like you can't be cut off or excommunicated if you are also dead. That is true. So that's interesting. And then so we sort of raises the question of what does that mean and when you would apply that. We could get into that. Uh, I'm not going to focus on that so much, but I think it's a great question. Okay. So I was just trying to belabor the obvious. It's like, you know, we, we give our harshest punishments to, to, to murderers. And because we're worried that like social order would collapse if murderers would be able, like some people, you know, uh, we won't get into why, but you know, people have the temptation to get rid of other people. And that's a bad thing because that could lead to more people doing that. And that would be a really bad thing for society. So we try to eliminate that with the harshest punishments. I'm talking in consequentialist terms. You could probably come up with other reasons, but that's certainly true, okay? Now, if you look at Chazal, so this I just presented, I'm not gonna focus on this. If you look at um, sources 3a through 3c, right? Um, you see a couple of things. So one is, this is very famous. This Mishnah in Makot is extremely famous and people trot it out to say that, you know, capital punishment is not something that we're, that's popular in Judaism and it's true, right? The idea is that, now it's interesting is this, 
business about uh, you know a Sanhedrin that did this once in many you know many years whatever how many years it is that would execute someone for uh, for murder. Um, that is about murder. It's not about Shabbat, right? It's not even discussed as a possibility that they would actually execute someone for violating Shabbat. Now the technical reasons for that have to do with you know the 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 various um, criteria that, that, that our sages put in, you know, making it very, very, very hard to actually implement, right? That, you know, what does it mean to actually have in mind that you intentionally were violating Shabbat? Uh, and, you know, what, you know, what was that intention? Did you get warned, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Very hard to come up with those criteria. But the fact of the matter is that's not even really discussed. It's like not something that apparently was done. Um, as far as we know, you look at these three different sources here, um, there's one source that maybe says like it's a possibility, but it's actually kind of put aside uh, as a possibility. No, 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 no. It wasn't that someone was they, they were that the, the court was going to execute someone for what is it for um, uh, you know clipping something off a fig tree. It was because someone used it for murder. That makes more sense to people. Not that you would actually be killed for violating Shabbat. And the last thing is actually interesting. I don't know where the Rambam gets this from. This is from Maimonides in the Mishnah Torah, and he's saying, um, he's talking about sort of basically a hierarchy of, of crimes, of sins. Um, and he says, does not need to be said, right? Forbidden sexual relations or the desecration of Sabbath, or Sabbath are not like the spilling of blood. They're lower down, okay? However, if you actually read the Torah, right? That's not what you find. What you find is the Torah goes out of its way. If you did not have this story in um, Parashat Shlach, this is in chapter 15 of, of, of Numbers, if you did not have this story, you would not have missed it. There's nothing in the story that, that Chazal actually derive new law from. They struggle with understanding what it is that the wood gatherer did wrong. And it's you know, it's it doesn't do anything to move the narrative along of the story. This is after, right after the sin of the scouts of the Chedim Raglim. It's just a story that's sort of added there. It's right between actually a lot of legal material, um, right before it's the Parashat Tzitzit, and you would not miss it. But the Torah goes out of its way to tell you that they stoned to death a man that they find in the wilderness gathering wood. We're not exactly sure what the Koshesh Eitzim actually means. That's the usual way we translate it. Someone is gathering wood. They bring him, there's a citizen's arrest. They bring him to, to Moshe for adjudication. And Moshe um, brings the case to God. He apparently doesn't know. Not clear what exactly. And then there's a debate about what exactly technically Moshe didn't know, because it does say you put murder, you, you put sh 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 Shabbat violators to death. And that is what they do. They stone him to death. Now, this story plays off, we're going to see a bunch of, but the most obvious other piece of narrative that this story plays off is in source five. And this is something we'll read uh, actually after Pesach now, because the, the Parshiot are all uh, broken up. But um, in Parshat Emor, the end of Parshat Emor, uh, Leviticus 24. And here we have a story, right, which has a lot of parallels. So I've put in blue a lot of language that if you look at source four and source five, you'll see these two stories are playing off each other. Very, very similar. The difference is this case is not, they don't find someone who's by, uh, gathering wood. In this case, there's a fight. And uh, people who are at the periphery of the community uh, in some way, sort of described, I'm not important, we won't get into too much. They get into some kind of fight. Um, it seems to be a lack of discipline is what the story is about. Uh, you know, so in anger, one of them, um, utters the name of God in some, in some way that either just the uttering of it or um, he, he blasphemes in some way. That's a little bit unclear. And then basically the adjudication of the case is very similar. Um, a difference in terms of how it's presented is that the Torah, and then he's stoned to death. That's the, that's the judgment. But a key difference is that there's legal, basically there's a, there's a bunch of legal, there's legal material that is added in that God, and, and, the, and the key point here, and I put it in bold, is that we learn that a, a um, this is what's in bold with in English and in Hebrew, we learn that the, a blasphemer is equivalent to a murderer, okay? 
Now, I got to say, even if we didn't have the, the, our question about the Shabbat, we might say, hey, is blasphemy really that bad? Is it as bad as murder? We might have that question about blasphemy. Anyone, like, why would blasphemy be, you know, blasphemy be so bad? Right, so we have a taboo to this day of saying the name of God, right? Um, so it's clear it's a, a big, big issue in the Jewish tradition. Um, but we don't put people to death for it, I don't think. Similarly, that's also not mentioned in, as a, an issue in the Torah. I'm sorry, in, in Chazal. But why might that have been so bad? Why do you think that's judged so harshly? Any ideas? Oh, I'm looking, I keep on, I have to look at the chat. Yeah, there's yeah. some uh, interesting questions in chat. Um, yes, Ozzy, that's sort of like, that's what I've summarized when we're speaking of the a periphery of the community. There's something going on there with uh, maybe some kind of resentment, something like that, that leads to emotion, seems to be part of it as being on the periphery that leads to, I think, the. So let me hold on that. Let's come back to that question. All right. So let's go to the Shabbat. So, okay. I want to put this context a little bit more context. Oh, someone put another answer. Um, Yeah, well, um, either way, we don't have that kind of issue uh, of someone being of, of coming up in that harsh kind of way. I want to remind us something else. That's so this is again, chapter source six is just chapter 16 of Exodus again, the Parashat Haman. And let me remind you that this is not the story of the Makoshe Shiksim, the wood gatherer, is not the first story of Shabbat violation. Right? It's the second story. We have two stories. In fact, that's pretty unusual if you think about it. In the Torah, we don't have other stories, right, of people violating mitzvot, of commandments. We have stories about idol worship. We have stories of unruly, you know, various things that are, uh, you know, of the moment, um, essentially. So I guess you could say we have, uh, you know, a violation of one or two of the other commandments in the sin of the golden calf. But there's not really anything um, where you have, well, you certainly don't have two stories, a violation of a particular commandment like Shabbat, I would say. Um, and then, so here's what's in bold, right? We have, they, on the seventh day, they go out and they collect, which by the way, not so different from the Koshe Sheikhsim, right? They're collecting something, right? Interesting. And um, the response is harsh, no doubt. God thinks this is a big, big, big deal. And he doesn't say just like, why didn't you just listen to me um, with the Shabbat? He's saying, this is like violating everything. Right? Until when are you going to stop violating my commandments and my instructions? Right? But then the response is the heart of what we said, um, you know, is this very, very nice response, which is pay attention. I gave you this gift. And remember, we, as we talked about last, uh, in the last session, it's like this, you know, this notion of the, um, you know, the, 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 the good king who gives you the good life of, of peace and security. That's Shavu Ishtachtav. Everyone should sit under it like sitting under the, the, the fig tree. So it's a very different response, right? So very, very strange narratively now, right? That the wood gatherer would be treated so harshly. That's true, Ozzy, but does it, does it require capital punishment? If, if it was just, put it this way, would we think about the story differently if it was a lighter punishment in some way. Like, I don't know, put him outside, like what happens to Miriam, right? Put put the, the Sabbath violator outside the camp for some time or something like that. Like, all right, like do that, right? All right, I wanna suggest something to you. All right, so this is um, at the heart of not only of, so this is a story we don't think about very much. Usually if you're gonna read the Parsha, uh, Parsha Shlach, um, you're gonna focus all about the scouts. I, I don't remember the last time I heard any rabbi give a sermon about the story of the wood gatherer. Um, but I wanna suggest it's a monumentally important story for understanding the Torah's presentation of the Shabbat and for our understanding of the invention of the seven day week. And it goes like this, okay? I want you to all imagine that it's a Wednesday. Let's imagine the story does not take place on the Shabbat. 
Imagine it's a Wednesday, okay? Imagine it's not this story, it's in our own lives. And it's a Wednesday. Can you imagine a circumstance, you, each of, each of us personally, imagine a circumstance where you would get extremely angry at someone, maybe even to the point that you'd be willing to cause them, you know, basically to you know, affect a citizen's arrest in this way, be a vigilante, right? Just because they were gathering wood. Really angry at someone just for gathering wood. And it's a Wednesday, nothing to do with Shabbat violation. Imagine you're not Jewish. Okay, it has nothing to do with Shabbat, nothing to do with mitzvot. Can you imagine being really angry? And before, let me say this. If you can't imagine a situation like this, you are not trying hard enough. Every single person on earth can think, should be able to, they think hard enough, put themselves in a situation where you'd be very angry at someone just because they gathered wood. I don't know. Yes, you do. Think about it. Why would, what would need to be true about the situation for you to be able to get angry? They were told not to do it. That's, I'm saying specifically wood, right? And what is it about the wood? What has to be true about the wood? Okay, my property, you said that Ozzy. Okay, Ozzy, say it's on your property and someone gathered the wood. Why would you care so much? What kind of jerky neighbor are you? Like, I get it. You don't want people on your property, okay? It's your wood, okay? But, you know, I, I put it to you right now, Ozzy. If you did have, let's say you have a summer home somewhere, something like that, I don't know, and you have a cord of wood out in the back, you would be pretty pissed if, an, if someone came and took it. That's true. But you also might think, you know, would you be this angry? What would have to be true about it for you to be that angry? I'm telling you, if you can't think of this, then you're not trying hard enough. It's a violation of a covenant. What does that mean? That's not, I don't know what the word covenant means. I, I want to hear Amer American English. <laughs> Many hours of work and collecting. Okay, you put a lot of work into it. Violation of an agreement. Okay, I think we're getting there. We're getting there. Let me ask you this. Has it happened? He cheated on us. What's, who's the us? Who's the us and what kind of agreement do we, why do we have agreements about wood? <laughs> Why would we have agreements about wood? What has to be true about the wood? Value. Can we imagine a situation where the wood has very high value, tremendously high value? If you're in the desert and you're wandering, yes. Yes, what kind of situation would that have to be? What would we use the wood for? Building. Building, construction perhaps. Sacrifices sacrifices yeah i mean but like make it more relatable i don't give sacrifices do you what what uh what for us cooking. even us cooking. what's that cooking. cooking yeah what if you couldn't what if you had no way of cooking your food if you had uh if you didn't have wood that could be a situation we'd be in right what else do we use wood for construction. Nah, religion. religion comes later we need to live construction construction okay but construction's a little longer term could be for shelter Let's say perhaps to like basically, I mean, don't get really desperate for this, right? Yeah, you guys are thinking too much about the text. I'm talking about us relatedly, Asherah trees. We don't care about that stuff, right? What we care about is, is food, heat. How about heat? Ah. What, if cold? what if we could like die of frostbite, right? And we needed this wood in order to stave off the frostbite. Wood would be really valuable, right? Every single person on this call could be in a situation like that. We're just lucky we're not, right? Not that long ago, we were in a situation like this. It wasn't wood, but maybe it was toilet paper. Maybe it was eggs, right? Maybe it was hand sanitizer. I'm talking about March, 2020 or April, 2020. People did, people were extremely angry when other people got access to what all of a sudden became valuable commodities that basically were violating or potentially violating some kind of social agreement, right? So what has to be true Right? For us to, oh, there we are. 
uh, what's this? What's this? Uh, Charles. Well, let me come back to this one second. Okay, let me just, uh, uh, it takes me a little bit to read that. Here's the key, okay? This is what's known in modern social science work on ecology as the tragedy of the commons. Tragedy of the commons is the tragedy of the commons. I'll put that in the chat, okay? That's what this story is. It's a, it's a, it's a you could call it a, an allegory for the tragedy of the commons. That's what this is called. And the tragedy of the commons is any situation where we have a very valuable resource. Could be a fishery, how much you know, fish is available. How much, uh, you know, it could be the commons, meaning grazing area, which would be very, you know, uh, could be water in a, in a watershed, something like that. And if two things are true about it, one is the commodity is very, very valuable. For whatever reason, it has, it's always gonna be very particular to the situation, time and place, the culture people are in, number one. And number two, it's not that person's. Even better than being at someone else's property, it's common property. It belongs to everyone. In the end, all property really is common property, right? Just by social agreement that we give out private property, okay? And so in situations like that, so imagine you have a very, very, very precious resource. And by agreement, right, we manage it collectively, right? But there's not maybe enough for every, to go around for everybody, for everybody. And so we have to be very disciplined. Somebody then who goes and grabs, right, who tries to steal off in the night or whatever it is, is a big threat to the whole community. Because social order could collapse if that happens, right? What could happen? Everyone follows them and does the same. And then, right, we have basically this is Hobbesian state of nature, a war of all against all. So, I want a little, a little take from the text, right? Which is the Shabbat is not really what's being violated here in the technical sense. What's being violated, so what Shabbat is, is an opportunity. If wood is very precious now, and look at source, where is it? Uh, eight, I think, right? Where are we? Or is it seven? Look at source seven. Okay, very interesting. This is the beginning of the Parsha. This is when Moshe sends the spies out and he says, what should you look at for when you're in Egypt? I mean, sorry, in, in, in Canaan, in Canaan. It's funny, he doesn't say Ayesh by Eitzim. Are there trees, right? He says, Ayesh by Eitz. Is there even a tree, right? In Canaan. So we have a textual indicator, right? We don't even need a textual indicator. They're in the middle of the desert. There's not a lot of wood and they need wood. They build stuff with wood, but also they need it to keep warm. It's gonna be a very, very precious resource. And it's clearly doesn't belong to anybody. It's a common property. And so if everybody is resting, right? That becomes an opportunity for someone to go out and raid the commons. And that's what he's up to. Now, here's the thing. This is, and this is what was really tricky at the beginning of the pandemic. I don't know about you, but I know people who basically engaged in something we might now call hoarding behavior. They weren't doing it because they were greedy, right? There's a third story, by the way, in Tanakh that plays off these two, and that's the story of Achan uh, in, the, in, in Yoshua Perak Zion, in, in Joshua 7. That's a story of greed. So he basically, you know, he takes valuables from the, the booty, from the, the, um, the war against Jericho. That's not what this is. This is not greed. We can empathize with someone who gathers wood because here's the logic. And it's a very, very powerful and pernicious logic, which is imagine you're saying to yourself, okay, we all need wood. I need wood to like cook for my child. I need wood to keep ourselves warm. We all need it. If everybody's resting, how am I supposed to be confident that the other parents aren't going to go out and raid the commons. And so if they're gonna do it, why should I be, as the Israelis like to say, a friar? Why should I be the friar that stays in my tent? I should go do it first. That's why people go and do the things like they were doing at the beginning of the pandemic. It's because they're afraid that someone else is gonna do it first. 
That's the really powerful logic that brings down social order. It's defensive, not offensive. We can empathize with it, but it doesn't help solve the situation. So I'm gonna suggest that's what this story is about. And the Shabbat at the time, as we've already said, was a new institution. No one had it yet, right? And so that accentuates the problem. There was no one, no one had any like muscle memory, no personal commitment, no generations of observing Shabbat, right? No love of Shabbat. How could they? They hadn't experienced it, just one or two, right? So it was very, very fragile. And so then it can't be kind of a barrier against this. And that's what the, the Torah is telling us about. Now, let me show you, if we're on that, I see the chat. Let me show you how, yeah, like global warming. I'm saying, um, I'm saying it's the same logic. Yeah, tragic. The, the issue around um, using the planet's resources um, is a, another tragedy of the commons problem. Right, and it's good, there's good law arguments for it, right? So like if you're the Chinese or you're a developing country and you say, hey, Western countries have been basically raiding the commons for, you know, since the beginning of the industrial revolution, now it's our turn. You're gonna tell us we've got to turn it off. You go first, you guys turn off your economies first. That's the logic, right? It's the same, very same logic. And it's the logic that would have been um, there, we'll talk about this more next week, at the very beginning of trying to build the Shabbat for anyone who would have tried to build it. But now let's see actually how this, you can now see this in um, a couple of different texts. Oh, the first one I'm going to go back to is, so why um, do we think perhaps that the punishment in the first Shabbat, the first, first Shabbat violation isn't so harsh? Exactly, that's the story I was mentioning. Um, who was saying that? Um, Ozzy, yeah, that's the story of Achan. Achan is the one who takes the booty. Um, it's a very similar, and it's, it's pernicious, right? There, in that case, it's a story of greed. Greed is the threat. Here, the threat is defensive, right? You, no, one, no one basically shows off to other people by their, their wood. Um, some people do, too, but it's more, you know, in Achan, it's the case of, oh, my question, Noah, thank you, is, so we have a story now. Now we can see why um, in this, uh, at the very beginning, that it, there's a logic to why Shabbat violators would have been treated so harshly. But the very first Shabbat violation, which is here, in the case of the man, when they went out and collected man, even the Moshe told them not to do that, they weren't treated very harshly. Moshe was yelled at, actually. They weren't even yelled at, let alone killed, let alone punished, right? What's the difference in these two episodes? They're still learning. Okay, so I agree with that. It's like maybe it's the first versus the second also. Yeah, it's, but I would say, remember what we said last session, it's not just that they're learning, right? It's that God is training them. That's the quote from Moshe in the 40th year about what God is doing here, okay? And notice, by the way, okay, so let's think about this for a second. What I said was, if everybody raids the commons, if everybody does what the wood gatherer does, all hell breaks loose, social order collapses, and they certainly don't get a Shabbat. Shabbat destroyed, but also the larger social order is destroyed. In the case of gathering man, is the threat, is the same threat there? If everybody goes off and gathers man, will social order collapse? Will the Shabbat be destroyed? It's a renewable resource. Yeah, good. Okay. Right. What else is true? That's true about the man. That's true, Ozzy, but not everything has that big a threat. Not as big a threat, but it does in this case. Right. But why is it why is the, the gathering of man on Shabbat not as big a threat? One, I think I like that point about the renewal resource, but it's even even simpler than that. What happens when they go out and they try to collect man on Shabbat? Yeah, exactly, Charles. It's not there. There is no man on Shabbat. It doesn't fall. There's nothing to collect, right? Similarly, earlier in the week, when they try to over collect, they try to grab more from the commons because they're worried where they're gonna get food the next day from. It doesn't work. 
right? It miraculously get the same. They keep, they keep it over. You know, somehow they don't eat all of it. They try to store it. Like it's all disincentives, right? This is the train. Basically, the mind is like training wheels because all of the incentives to raid the commons are turned off. God miraculously turns them off. Boom, boom, boom. We, and what's nice is about the story is we can understand why they're tempted. They don't know where their next meal is coming from. So they try to store it. They try to gather more. They try to go on Shabbat. Then each time God's like, you guys, trust me, right? Just trust me. I'll bring you food. Just do this. Okay. But that's training wheels. And the story of the, of the Mekoshe Shetim, of the wood gatherer is like, now we're taking the training wheels off. Okay. With respect to fuel, not with respect to food. And then we've got to, we're starting to get out into the real world, what it's going to be like when we don't have miraculous ways of snuffing out those incentives that would otherwise kill off the Shabbat and the week. Okay. All right. Let me show you two other. Exactly. Yeah, I like that. All right. Let me show you two other texts in the Torah. And they happen to be the two other texts that have the verb, la koshation. There's actually a third. There's, right? There's a really, really thing in, oh, I forgot, it says uh, later Naveen. There's a really, um, I, I'm not going to get into it today, but I can send you if you're interested. There's only four times in the entire Tanakh um, or sections of Tanakh where this verb, the koshesh, which like I guess we don't really know what it means, really. Uh, it seems to have something to do with straw, which you can see from source eight. Okay? So <clears throat> this source is the story of what I like to call Paro's anti-Shabbat temper tantrum. All right, and this is just the story of Moshe and Aaron, their first appeal to, God, to, to Paro. And they say, let my people go and worship me in the, in, you know, serve me in the, in the wilderness. And um, Paro says, I don't know what God you're talking about. I don't know this God. And instead he enforces a very harsh regime, okay? Now I put in orange in this text, the various ways that this text is playing off of the story of the man. Okay, um, what you can see is knowledge of God. He doesn't know who God is. That's important part in the, in the um, story of the man and throughout the next chapters too. Um, oh, here it is basically the Koshulahem Tashlatevin twice. Basically the, at the heart of Paro's response is they're going to have to somehow make straw for the mortar out of little pieces of straw. They got to handle little pieces of straw and make them, something like that, okay? And, um, and then in orange are things that relate to the story of the mind. You have, now you have a king giving you something. In this case, he's not giving you something. He's not giving you the straw. You're gonna make it yourself, right? Um, you have the allotment. Remember, we saw that both in the story of like allocation, fixed allocation. That was in um, what the began, what got them really worried was the fixed allocation of water in, at Mara. Um, and that was going back to Yosef, who was uh, giving off a fixed allocation and giving off food, being kind of like godlike. And Paro is here also being godlike um, and basically deciding essentially the terms by which they live and don't live. Um, what I'm putting in green, you'll see is there's a drumbeat in this story. Very, very important. There's a drumbeat, which is every day, every day, every day. You see that in two different ways. Kitmol shil shom, like yesterday, like the day before, twice, uh, three times. Over here, you have it like extra. Kitmol shil shom, gam tmol, gam hayom. Yesterday, like today, today, like today. The theme is, and you see it also, where is it? Um, uh, Dvar yom biyomo, right? Like every day. And that phrase shows up again in the parashat Haman. That's how God says he's going to give them on day after day, day after day. The difference is in the man, they get a break. Here, no break day after day, day after day. And look at this, see that purple? That there is the first time in the Torah that a human being uses the verb lishbot. Um, or it's, hish, it's hishbit there, right? That, that, um, that, that, that um, shoresh, that root, uh, to Sabbath. And what does he mean by it there? What he means by is taking a break right? Giving the people a break from their toil. Not only that, but he's basically saying, and this is, I'm drawing here on, on a Rav, Rav Shamshan, 
Shem Shem Rafael Hirsch, who I don't have the text here for. But he's basically saying here that it's a big mistake, you guys. He's saying to Moshe and Aaron as fellow elites, he's saying it's a big mistake to give uh, the common people a day off to worship God. Don't you know that religion is controlled by, the, by, by elites, by us? It's a game that we play, something like that. You don't give it to the masses. Religion is, is something we use to bamboozle the public. It's not something that, that it's not something we democratize, right? If you look at the, the um, I'm, I'm just gonna leave it for you, given the time. If you look at the next sources, we have a, a fascinating Midrashic tradition, which plays off this story um, and Moshe's first, when he first goes out, when he's young and goes out and sees the, the, the uh, you know, his suffering of his people, the same word, Sivlotam shows up. And the tradition is, right, it's, it's, as we said before, Midrash, I don't think meant to be taken as the true story, but rather cluing you in to what's going on, the messages behind the text. It's saying that um, Moshe had the idea of the seven-day week, of the Shabbat, at that time, told Paro, hey, they'd be more productive if they had a day, a break every seven days. And so give them off. And Paro's like, oh, it's a good idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll be more productive. So let's give them that day. And then when Moshe and Aaron come back and say, let my people go, Paro, the next Paro says, no way. That's it. You know what the problem is? They've been taking this break every seven days. And they've started to like basically um, you know, start to uh, have, you know, start to agitate, have different ideas. They would read texts that told them about the fact that they were, they have, you know, they, they were, the land was promised to them and they're going to get out. And so we got to cut this out. So it's a very strange midrash, but not if you read the text as I'm proposing. What Chazal are doing is they're clued in to the anti Shabbat theme in this text, the drumbeat of now you're going to have to work every day, every day, every day. Why is the text going out of its way to do that? To emphasize the tyranny of working every day, every day, every day at the king's diktat. Now, one other thing I wanna mention, okay? There's a, this, the, what Paro's response here, um, and I've always been struck by the fact that this is not in the Haggadah, it should be in the Haggadah, and I don't know why it's not. It's a very interesting question. The, par, the Haggadah focuses on the early part of the story, but not on here, for reasons that I don't fully understand. Because this story here is terrifying. There's a, there's a, a, a a regime of indirect control that sounds right out of the Holocaust, right? Where they, he sets up um, basically, you know, Jewish overseers who have to have these impossible situations where they have to, um, you know, basically, you know, decide if they're really gonna, you know, um, you know, maybe they can do some good by, you know, et cetera. That, that's the logic uh, by basically doing, uh, doing, doing Paro's bidding. But there's another thing, the koshesh kash, that's heaven, that's what they have to do. Now think about it for a second. What Paro is doing is sending them out into the Egyptian commons, into the, into the, the, the Sadot, right? Into the fields that are outside the cities, for instance. And they have to gather little pieces of, of maybe, you know, worse, little pieces of something, right? They're going to do anything, basically what the wood gatherer was doing, okay? But they all have to do it. And now think about, let's say you are strong and you're young. And you really want to fill that quota because otherwise you'll be beaten if you don't fill that quota. But there are other people who are older, who are weaker. And now you face every single person who's in that situation faces a dilemma, which is, do I do for myself or do I take care of others? And so what, what, the, what the Torah is here is doing, this is what I mean by being anti-Shabbat, it's anti the kind of regime that, that God is trying to create with the Shabbat, right? Where you're, so the, the threat, so in the, in the other case, what we're trying to do is, is to train the people, right? To mitigate the temptation to compete with each other in a pernicious way for social order to collapse. Here, the intent is for social order to collapse, to destroy community. It's the opposite, okay? You see that? Like basically it's, 
basically creating incentives not to help people out, directly doing that. Right? Where God is doing is turning off the incentives to compete with each other in that way, with the mind. Right? And then there's a training plan. Let me, say, let me show you one last text. This is the other story of the Koshesh in the Torah. When I, I never heard of this story before I'm not, um, until I was looking for something else. And I certainly never heard of it with the language that shows up when you read it in this way. This is a story of Isha Almana Mekosheshet Eitzim. There's a story, right? People may have heard of the, the Mekoshesh Eitzim, the Ish Mekoshesh Eitzim. This is a story of a woman who is a Mekosheshet Eitzim. And so this story, I don't know if, you, if you've read it before. I don't think I had before this project. It's known, actually, Christians tend to know this story better than we do, um, where it's known as the, because it's refer, referred to in the Gospels, um, by the, as, the, as the widow from Zarephath, how Manami Tzarephath. And the context is, it's during, so Eliyahu Navi has called down a batzare, a, um, uh, you know, a drought as punishment for the evil um, king and queen, right, of the kingdom of, of Israel, Achav and Yizavah. And then what happens is he then, is, there's a dilemma, which is that like, then no one has anything to eat, not just the king and the queen, but even common people have nothing to eat, nothing to drink. And so the way this is often inter interpreted is that Eliyahu was then taught a lesson, a series of lessons about being a Kanai, being kind of too harsh, okay? That's context. But the specifics is basically he's told you're good, you should go to a um, this this woman who's going to be mekoshesh at eitzim, and she is going to be she's going to sustain you. The same exact language used for that Yosef is the She she he's going to take care of you. She is going to. Sorry, I put an orange again. Various um, there's a lot of referencing to earlier um, stories, as often the case in Nach. And in particular, there's a lot of references here to Rivka um, and, and shows up here in, in, in certain kinds of ways, but in particular to stories of the man. There's a lot of referencing of the man. Um, but the, and at the heart of that is what happens is Eliyahu says, so she, he finds her and she's basically, what she says is that she's basically got some pieces of wood together and she's cooking the last meal. She's got a little piece of uga. Ma'og or Uga, which is another way that man is described. She's cooking it for her son because after, and this is going to be their last meal. After that meal, they're going to die because they have no food left. And Eliyahu says, oh, that's all right. Feed me and, you, and, and your son and you. And basically feed me first, he says, because God's going to do a miracle and there's going to be enough food until the drought is over. So it sounds familiar if you think about it. That's the story of the man, right? That's what God does. It's basically vayancha vayarivecha, vayarivecha, um, Moshe says, right? Basically, he, he gives them enough food for them to survive, right? But otherwise, they would, they would starve. And that's what they're worried about, okay? In this case, she's not Jewish. By the way, she brings God into the story. She says something about your God. The opposite of power. And I want so think about the imagery for a second. You have a mother. Think about it again. We start off with like, okay, what's the you know what's the opposite of a situation where there's a precious resource, right, that I need for my family, and that you went and grabbed it? How dare you? Okay, and that you know pr it's precious because we're gonna die if we don't get access to that resource. We could. Here, that's the situation she's in. And she's being asked to share by someone who represents not her God, seemingly from the story, simple person. And this is the classic situation, a mother who is basically trying to feed her child. And she does it. She goes along with it. Not only that, and he dies. So she wasn't kidding around. It really was that situation. She comes to Eliyahu and says, I put faith in you. They did eat for a while, and then it was not enough. The drought went on too long or something like that. And this is one of two stories in Tanakh in which the prophet uh, prays, uh, basically brings a child back to life. So that's another whole thing. How should we understand that? But here's the thing. 
many times in, in Tanakh, there's a wonderful book by um, uh, Judith Kutzner about this, um, and there's others who make this point, right? Um, there are stories in later books of, of Tanakh, um, even within the Torah itself, that are in some sense tikkuns, right? Um, and it's often a woman who's playing that role. Moral, uh, what's, what do we translate tikkun? Like a moral correction, moral fix for sins in early parts of, of the Torah. So this story I wanna suggest shows you that the understanding that I presented about the Mekosh Sim was known because it's the opposite. It's the Isha Mekosh Sim is the very opposite. Notice, by the way, there's nothing about Shabbat here. That's not what it's about. It's about how do we maintain social order in the face of understandable incentives to worry about yourself first. And in this case, she is a paragon of selflessness and faithfulness. Whereas the Mekosh Sim represents and, and you know, upholding society as a result, if we had more people like that, we'd be in much better shape, right? Whereas the Mekosh Sim represents faithlessness and selfishness, even somewhat you know, justifiably, but it can't be justified collectively. Um, and so it's basically you know, helping to, I think, reinforce the point, these four different stories that are all pointing at the same point, that um, the, you know, to two related points, let me switch over to, uh, we got two minutes, I'm sort of on time. Stay on if you want to just for the, I will definitely come back to this next week because it is really important. Let me just share what, uh, summarize where we are. Uh, here we are. So why is the punishment so harsh? Okay. Short answer is because the temptation to violate Shabbat would have been very, very strong in what I'd say the first week, the first several, several weeks. But it's a fledgling institution. And in that context, but almost in any context, you can think about reasons why everyone's resting. If everyone's resting and we don't have any prior commitment to this thing, I haven't any experience with it being good or anything like that, but you know, everyone else is gonna keep their stalls closed in, this, in the shuk on Shabbat in this day, new day that I've never experienced before. They've never done that before. Why would I trust them to do that? Everyone else is not gonna graze. Everyone else is not gonna you know, take water. Everyone else is not gonna fish. Why, don't, why, why would I trust them? So in the first week, right? There's no reason to trust that. And there's understandable reasons why people would not actually trust each other and say, well, let me just take a little. Right? And that logic leads to the whole thing collapsing. So the wood gather is a story, is basically a very subtle, but very powerful in general story of a dagger flung at the fledgling institution of the week and at the foundation of social order generally. It's a threat of social collapse, just like murder would be. Right? Or just like, so in the case of the blasphemer, I would come back to it and say something similar which is that it may not be such a big deal right now after we've already built for many generations a community built around love and fear of God. But at the very beginning, when they were new to this, right, there's a much greater threat to the whole thing collapsing, right? Because if we all don't, you know, if everybody all of a sudden treated the name of God with disrespect, then, that would, then there would be no community of God. And that's true at the very beginning when you're building it, it's less true later on, right? Murder is always a threat, okay? Um, but here's the flip side of it. It's not just that it's a threat, it's also an opportunity, right? So once you build this thing, as we know, the week then becomes kind of a bulwark against social competition. Once we're already committed to it, once we've built it and committed to it and we love it, then it provides, and maybe we also have reputation, right? For, um, based on it then it becomes a little bit of barrier to social competition run amok, if we can build it. Um, and then what we can see also is that this notion of man, manna, the, the man as, as training, right, become, has become clearer from this, right? So basically we're turning off all those incentives to raid the commons. And so we're experiencing what it's like to just basically you know, enjoy and be fed um, and have some confidence, building confidence. Okay, and the last thing is that you get a clear sense of 
you know, what it means to be living under the, you know, the, um, the regime of, of a divine king, uh, a beneficent king, um, rather than a tyrannical king or a human king in general, is the other part of the message. All right. And the last class what we'll do is we'll get to, okay, from a textual perspective, it's this question of, okay, well, how does Shabbat observance impact knowledge of God? In part, sorry, I should say, in part knowledge of God. That's a very, very strange thing if you think about it. How is that, why is that true? And I'm gonna suggest that this class in particular, this session that we did is key to unlocking that message. Um, and then that will come back to um, what the Torah's idea is about why it is that the seven day week was only invented once. That's what we'll get to, all right? And I just added this couple of things in the chat. Uh, Claps, oh, I got claps, all right, thank you. Um, so people can unmute, it's a lot easier for me to get through this thing, see. Yeah. Um, there's, and if you, in the last call, if you're on, if you're following along on Facebook and you have any questions, um, you know, it's been pretty quiet in that chat too, but if you've got anything to say, do say That's nice, Ozzy, yeah, I agree. It's not, we would never, that's what's amazing about that story, that, uh, we would never recommend a woman do this. We would never say to, the, to, to this woman, oh yeah, you should give out of your child's mouth and give it to the stranger, right? We would never recommend that. What she's doing goes well beyond what we would recommend. Right, and I like to say that in some ways she teaches us more about, even though it's not about the Shabbat at all, she teaches more about the message of the Shabbat than, uh, you know, than Shabbat observance can in some way, but certainly together with the other texts, together they, they kind of tell us what, what it means to build the Shabbat and what the Shabbat is all about and the week. All right, we all set? Yep, thank you. Um, thank you everyone who's joined. Thank you to everyone who's been going back and forth in the chat and talking uh, and Thank you for coming with questions, coming to class with uh, questions. I'd like to highlight one, if I may uh, plug a future class. There is, we're coming up on the end of the spring, of the pre-Pesach side of the spring's on, but there is one last new class, Seder Telling, which will take place on Tuesday, April 12th. And it will include um, Rabbi Lea Sarna, as well as several guest lecturers speaking on the, speaking about the, the, the Seder, is that, you know, the Seder because there is this tradition that in the times of the Mishnah that they would gather in Lod and Renebrach to tell the story of the Exodus, and you will retell that. If that looks interesting, or if you'd like to find out more about what, pe what previous um, teachers have taught about Pesach Adrish in the past, we also have a good amount of recordings, and you can find them all at pesach.grisha.org. Um, uh, Dr. Zuckerman, you had a hand up, and I'm sorry for cutting you off. So. Oh, I, I didn't. No, I didn't. <laughs> ah, okay. I, I wish everyone a Shabbat Shalom and a Chodesh Tov, and right. uh, we'll uh, look forward to seeing you folks next week. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, everyone, for coming.